Hello, everybody. Uh, Howdy. Welcome, everybody. This is our uh, monthly social. Um, we have a few people joining us today, and um, we've got a few things on our docket for stuff to talk about. Um, so we'll have plenty of time afterwards to really dive into any topics that anybody else um, wants to ask or bring up. Um, or if they just want clarification on anything, we can always dive into things as well. Um, as always, we do have some of our GMs on with us. We have Rick and Ryan, as well as myself, um, here to assist and talk through these topics. So um, there's, there's really three big things that we want to talk about in this uh, social. Um, one, I want to introduce some of the changes that have happened to the website. Um, for anybody that, that may be looking at the website and looking at how it's kind of changing in format, um, which will lead us into our book we're going to talk about. Um, and then lastly, um, we're going to kind of talk about some of the, the writings that have been going on and what the goal around it is and um, just kind of make sure that that's clear for anybody who is wanting to participate. So um, before we start, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's just dive in. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, can you guys see that? Yep. Yep. All right, so here we have the website. Um, and for the most part, a lot of it is the same. But one of the things you guys will notice is that across the top here, this uh, the menu across the top has changed a little bit. Um, we had like three or four different sections that had a whole bunch of drop downs and you would scroll over and go to different options. We've kind of uh, summed it up a bit. We've got lore and rules and then we also have a, a direct link for character creation as well. So for those that are looking to create a character, that's a quick reference for them. Um, but for most of our content, we have the lore and rules. So I'm going to click on it here. Um, and the way we've designed this is we've broken it down into a lot of different categories. Um, you can see here we've got major planes, minor planes, nations, geography. Um, we've got cities, races, cultures, groups, houses, NPCs, and then also down at the bottom is game rules. Uh, so we're trying to break it up more into individual topics to make it easier to find what you're looking for. And if you're not sure what you're looking for and you have like a keyword, let's say beast folk, you can actually come up here to the search and type in beast folk. And it will give you all of the different articles that has beast folk listed in it. Um, but the one we're looking for here is the one right at the top, beast folk. Um, instead of going to that though, I'm going to show you guys just a little bit about how the structure of these categories works. Um, let me just refresh the page. There we go. So um, beast folk is a, a particular type of race. Um, just like some of the other races that exist, dwarves, elves, humans, orcs. Um, and so we have uh, a category here for races. And so we can see here, we've got some different articles, dwarves, elves, humans, beast folk, orcs, non-native races. We're still working on, on uh, a reference there for players that want to play non-native. But Beast Folk is our focus here. Now, Beast Folk is kind of a um, specialty race in that it's not one specific type of race. It's a gathering. 
Oh, am I not showing this? Let me fix that. I'm just going to share the screen. There. So let me show that again real quick, just to, to kind of clarify. Here are the, the different categories that I was talking about. Um, very easy to, to kind of sort through. Um, and you can even see how many articles are underneath each one. Um, and down here at the bottom is the specific game rules. So um, for this, like I said a moment ago, we're gonna go races. And that brings us to a page that's gonna show us all of the different uh, pages that we have under that category. Um, so non-native, orcs, beastfolk, humans, elves, dwarves. Um, and you can also come over here and see the, the entire list on the side as well. So say you wanted to go look at nations, you can go select it from here and so on. Um, but like I was saying, big topic for today is beast folk. Um, so one of the big differences between beast folk and the other races is that the beast folk is kind of, of a collective term of any kind of animal or insectoid um, personified race. Um, so you might have a, a cat folk or you might have a turtle folk or a monkey folk even. Um, and these are all going to be classified under beast folk. Um, all of them, they're all uniquely different in their own realm, uh, but for the sake of the game and simplicity, we just classify them as one. Um, with a lot of the writings that we've been posting out, we've been posting a lot of cultures. Um, but this is the first race that we've focused on. And um, we really wanted to talk about this one in the, in the social here because, um, well, frankly, we've done a lot of changes with Beast Folk. We have, with a lot of recent events, um, there's a lot of, companies looking back at their practices and looking back at what they create and how they um, function. And we also did the same thing. And we took a look at it and we were not happy with how we portrayed um, this specific uh, race within our game. And so we took that opportunity to redesign and redevelop the Beast Folk overall. One of the big focuses that we wanted to have was that um, the beast folk are intricate to the origin of our world. Now, we're not going to go into too much detail because we have a lot of mystery built into to these guys, um, but you can find beast folk in any region of Astral. Um, some regions you'll find them more than others, but they are everywhere. Um, usually between like 15 to 25% of a region it is potentially beast folk. Um, some areas that you're going to see it more in is going to be Ankarim, the, the region that was founded by the elves. Um, you're also going to see a lot of them in Duchy Stenstrom, which uh, is the Badlands Duchy, um, which we haven't focused on yet, I don't think, but that's coming. Um, and then you're, you're going to find them pretty much everywhere as well. Any questions so far, guys? Or is this feeling good? No, it's, it's I, yeah. Keep diving in. I have a question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey. So, hey. <laughs> um, okay, so would we say that the beast folk were here first? 
I mean, if they have such a, I mean, they can be found anywhere in the realm. Um, and we know that other people have also been there first. Is it, is it possible to say that the beast folk were there even before, let's say, either the orcs or the elves or whatever? So that I would say real quick, that's an in-game question. If you want to get that answered, get the answer to that question, you should answer, ask that question in-game. <laughs> because there is an answer to that. And yeah. Yep. Uh, that's, that's part of the, the stuff that we hope to eventually come out in-game. We've got a lot of content that we would love to play with when it comes to the Beast Folk, and finding out their origins is a big part of that. Um, so we do know um, that Beast Folk are very old in the world of Estrell. Uh, we do know that um, between them, the Elves and the Dwarves, those are the three oldest races, but really who came first um, is not widely known. Now, the beast folk, for the most part, do not um, hold a, uh, a, a unified culture in the sense that um, they look or they wear different clothing or that they have different beliefs or anything, they tend to adopt whatever culture they live in. And so in that regards, Beast Folk are some of the most adaptable um, of the races that exist in Estrell. Could that be so, uh, unified slavery? Well, see, that was one of the things that we took out, is that um, we we wanted to pull away from that aspect of it. And um, so slavery itself is not identified to the race. Now there may be still occasions of slavery happening in our world. We haven't really fully discussed that. Um, I think we might be nuking that, that idea. We might just yeah. shoot that, the idea that the idea of not necessarily the idea, the subject of slaving into the sun. Yeah. Just because realized that we weren't handling it really well and we didn't like the the story that was being crafted around the narrative so this is part of the reason why we've reworked we've reworked uh beast folk to be less of a second class citizen or a slave race to be a more a people with who are without a specific culture. Maybe more nomadic. More like, more like a people who have either lost their culture somewhere along the way or or who have an identity of integration. Yeah. A bunch of hippies. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I have you, a question on that uh, in a second. Yeah. I'll let I'll let y'all finish. Um, but one of the, uh, I think one of the core tenets of that is, uh, uh, and definitely the, uh, part of the identity of being a beast folk is, um, is a, is a lot of social conformity and, uh, leaning into, uh, I don't know what all I can say about that. You, yeah. You, you can, you're, you're fine on uh, where you're at so far. Yeah, that's, um, that's yeah. The the beast folk overall, they they're taking on the aspects of the regions that they're sitting that they are within. Um, you might even kind of think of it a little bit like um, they've they've been within these cultures for so long that their culture is one and the same now. Um, so you, you have beast folk from different regions who have very different cultures, um, but we do have something that does tie them together. And that is um, fables and phrases and rhymes. There are certain 
beast folk fables that um, are passed down from generation to generation and are told to kids that um, they, they, they don't really know where they came from or what their origins are, um, but they are all um, kind of like nursery rhymes or like uh, games that kids would play like London Bridge or uh, Ring Around the Rosie or things like that. Um, and that's something that you find throughout the, the Beast Folk culture. Um, like we said, we're not entirely sure where those, those stories come from, but that is one thing that is unifying all of them. So, so think like Aesop's fables. I mean, there's, there's always, they pat the, the oral tradition of storytelling is a big part of this culture. Ben, I think you had something new one to ask. Yeah, uh, how does that influence uh, some of the already created stories that uh, have uh, beast folk being treated as slave races or second class citizens already woven in? That's uh, pretty heavily baked into Hanu's backstories. Well, yeah. Um, so, um, there's a couple of different ways that we can approach it. Um, with those backstories that you have, um, it could potentially be something where Hanu himself um, was affected by this, but it's not a, a cultural um, specific thing. So it's maybe fell into a, a wrong situation, a bad situation or something like that. Um, but we can help you kind of figure that out if we need to talk details here's one here's here's the biggest like lore retcon that we're gonna have to do um you you could easily have a from my from where we're sitting right now you could transition the narrative of hanu into a more region specific thing um maybe uh, uh, uh something that happened in a specific uh under a specific uh uh, yeah, in a very specific region, but we're taking those, the subsection of things like what were basically the runaway slave laws that applied to beasts only, and we're going, hmm, that's not cool. We're going to just take that and burn that um, uh, because one, that's a very uncomfortable subject matter, but two, it makes the human kingdoms fucking evil. Just direly evil language sorry uh <laughs> but they but like but it makes them irredeemable in, in in a certain light and so we're like ooh, yeah so if you want to have that potentially uh weave that into the narrative of maybe a more specific uh 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 uh, noble house or county or something like that 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 is more easily vilified other than the entirety of the majority human kingdom i think that's okay. going to free us up a lot more in narrative to like yeah does that make I, sense I, I i only got the tail end of that i apologize my wife uh called on the same phone that i'm using for this um but uh I could see that, I think. I believe it's been House Jernigan that yeah. has been most weaved into some of these stories. Um, and also, there's some of... Um, there was a cross-narrative between my character, Hanu, and Amy's character, whose name I cannot remember right now. Thikus. Uh, yeah. Thikus where Thikas had joined uh, what I'm going to call a group of freedom fighters, but they were also a little bit more revolutionary than others, and they were largely beast folk. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could impact the, the thing that she was starting to tell, too, because the two characters' approach to it, Hanu is much more pacifist by nature than Thikas is. Hanu is kind of like... Sure. Hanu takes indirect action. 
rather than like uh, being ready to start a war. And I've also, I've, I've weaved um, Kieran into some of that because he killed a group of slavers. Okay. And well, see, so you can, uh, and you can still use a lot of that stuff. It's just rather than it's a, rather than it's accepted by the society as a whole, we've retconned that. And it's just, you know, maybe the pocket, pockets of slavers in this region or a particular lord in this area. It makes it less of a, it makes it less of the need to revolt against a society as a whole and more of, okay, we have this one guy we can fight against. Does yeah, that make that, sense? That, it, it takes it from systemic racism to, uh, in, I guess, the word is endemic? I'm not, no. Yes, no. endemic to specific regions. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Again, that's, that's, that, yeah, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, we don't want the villain. We we want specific villains, not the villain to be the entire country, because then it then it really limits us in the in the capacity to go. Well, then this noble house shows up. Yeah, but all these nobles are evil because they're all like horrible slaver races, and we're like, uh, yeah, that that is true. Ooh, <laughs> and there is still the opportunity. And I'm sorry if I'm speaking over you. Uh, and there is still the possibility to encounter individuals who do have some racist beliefs. Oh yes, yeah. I would say I would say that is definitely the case. Yeah. Uh, but okay. um, yeah. yeah. It, okay. One of the, yeah, the yeah, biggest I'm, problem I'm is is to having uh uh like the, the the big reason why we're transitioning out of this is man it doesn't make a very good escapist narrative for certain people who want to play to uh, go into a world where there is a huge problem of systemic racism. It's like, oh, that's yeah. not escapist it's at all. Oof. No. It, 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 it does in, uh, enjoy the power fantasy of a clear delineated, those are the bad guys, or those are the, you know, that specific uh, group of people, or that specific in, uh, enemy, or, or you know, it lends itself to the to the the feeling of a fantasy. You go, yes, those are the guys that I don't want to that I want to oppose. Not like the system mm -hmm. is the thing that I have to oppose. Yeah. Well, I and, do like not having to. Uh, and again, apologies for uh, like interrupting. I do like the well, idea of not having to uh, come up with a reason why your beast folk was not registered, which is one of the yeah. things. That, uh, and that's where and. You know, a lot of it is moving away from that slave race type um, narrative. A lot of stories do it. It's a, it's you know, it's a very much a cliche in a lot of um, fantasy writings and famous in fiction. So really, we wanted to, you know, like Ryan said, make it a true, truest fantasy escape for for people um, getting rid of sy systemic racism, but then also. You know, it really challenges us as both GMs and players because you guys are just as much writing the story as we are to really come up with something that's unique to us and to this okay. world. I'm certainly cool with it. It's um, like I said, uh, the only the only hesitation I had was, uh, does this ruin all the stories that I've written? <laughs> um, but it doesn't sound like it does. It just kind of refocuses them. Uh, yeah. Interesting if because mean, in LA, and I have written about this in Hanu stories. Hanu has a little bit of, um, I, I would hesitate to call it racism, but it could it could be read as such. He has a little bit of racism from uh, from where he was raised. Uh, in his culture, humans are feared. Well, and see, that's that's another thing as well. Um, Hanu's not from this world, uh, so it's entirely possible that the world he came from, there could be a lot more of that there that you mm. could utilize as well. Um, but yeah, if, if you need help kind of getting ideas or tweaking things, by all means, just let us know and we can help figure that out. Um, I think it's good. I think it's good. Okay. Uh, I was just kind of like, I, I, I was basically just figuring out what, what y'all were talking about. If, um, if there is still some slavery going on in there, 
And if there are still some people who hold some of those attitudes, whether they're influenced by those other cultures or what have you, then all the things that I have going on in his stories are still the same. Yeah, it, and it may be that maybe a couple of names change or something like that, um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely doable. Um, this is this all the brings up. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Sorry, I keep talking. <laughs> it's also good that uh, maybe um, Kieran doesn't get in as much trouble with Simon for wearing somebody's face on his armor. Oh, he was just a slave. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, one of the other big things that, uh, uh, themes that we're focusing now towards, we're going to try to focus now towards is a focus away from race and more towards culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and cultural identities and stuff. Uh, as if you guys have been uh, keeping up with the the drops, you notice that we've stopped referring to these places as like the Elven lands or the Dwarven lands, and like giving them nation names and like cultural identities and uh, more reference to the people who live there as opposed to uh, the race that was that it is all founded around. And as a Giving, giving away potentially a little bit of, of uh, some things we have planned, not really giving away, but uh, uh, foreshadowing it, a, specifically a, a people who have, uh, don't have a specific cultural identity coming up in these themes of culture and exploring that and investigating why that is, is uh, one of the things that we're going to be hopefully playing around with. And uh, hopefully it's going to be a little bit more fun than the, than the uh, situation that we had beforehand. Yeah. Because as much as uh, swinging swords and, and uh, beating down villains is, is great, that is always going to be there. But uh, having that ability to play some of the political game or see some of the different cultures interacting that's where our game can really set itself apart and be something uh beyond a hack and slash and that's and the culture i think i think discussing you know once you learn about the culture your character is from and really exploring that as a player um that's going to make rp that much easier because you'll have so much more ties to this world it won't be just oh i'm an oh i'm an orc or oh i'm a dwarf or oh i'm an elf this is what they know no this is what my culture believes i'm from this country we have these beliefs and we have these holidays and we have these you know this is our typical dress you know what's your cult and just that interaction that are that role play is going to be so much more i think fluid in the process this also integrates uh the uh thought of uh non-native uh like uh, people from from different planes is uh it's not about the you know making it not about the race making it about the culture gives a person from that's not from this plane of existence something to identify with uh not that they you know you could come in as a tiefling and go well it's not that i identify with the humans or the elves it's i identify with this pe person's culture this is like the elvish culture resemble or the 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 culture of the Ankram resembles my culture a lot, or the uh, the culture of the uh, the, uh, the the Bahir re uh, resembles my culture a lot. And like I understand these people, and I understand where they're coming from, and yeah. So a, a lot of different focus changes, um, and the Beast Folk were really at the center of this. Um, paradigm shift, if you will. And so Beast Folk had been topic for us and the GMs and, and the staff for quite a while as we've been kind of re-looking at things. Cool. Any questions or any other, com any other comments or anything out there? Mild comment uh, back to Hanu again. Um, Hanu was dropped off at, at the monastery he was raised at. So it is possible 
however distant, that he is a native. He just doesn't know his people. Okay. Um, in which case, well, I don't know. I might be coming up with um, Bonnera for this realm. Well, and that sounds like a perfect thing for something we haven't talked about in a while, and that is personal quests. Um, if that's something that you want to figure out, like you have a set place where that is, great. And we can help, you can build a quest around discovering that. Or if you want us to kind of drop in possible solutions, possible things that Hanu can discover, then um, you can say, hey, I want to discover my homeland. And we can then kind of build a quest around that. Okay. We, we've been known to take, to take player, player goals and work them into small, small, medium, and large plots that, you know, that not just the player gets to ex experience, but multiple people as a whole get to kind of join in on it. might be interesting yeah point it has a kind of kung fu panda feel but that's just kind of uh, because of some similarities there <laughs> well and there's a lot of mystery around the beast folk and who knows maybe hanu is tied to some of that mystery maybe From 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 what the, from the vibes that I get from your character, some of the things that we have planned are gonna hook you. Like I just get that the sense that this that some of the things that we're gonna throw out there it, when we get back into the thing. I think even specifically the very first um, uh, camping event are gonna be a, a big hook for Hanu and a big hook for any of the the beast folk that are really invested into the idea of of uh, beast folk culture or beast folk mm -hmm. identity. Yeah. Cool. So, do we have any uh, other uh, big things about the Beast Folk that we haven't covered yet? Um, no, I do want to just re hit on uh, one more time the uh, fables and the rhymes and um, the, the different like phrases and things like that. Um, that's, that's, really one of the only cultural things that has carried through to this point. Um, and hopefully, if we play all of our cards correctly, um, they will have a importance in this world. Um, so it won't just be sayings or things like that, but they'll actually have meaning and, and can be really useful. Um, so that's one thing that I would really point out to anybody who is playing a beast folk or anybody who is um, curious or possibly thinking about playing a beast folk character. Um, feel free to come up with or think about possible fun, uh, fables, phrases, rhymes, things that um, they may have learned as kids. Um, and that'll be something that they would pass down from generation to generation. Dharma and Jalad. <laughs> okay. Um, real quick, uh, as, a, as a side note to, uh, to this, all this discussion about uh, the cultures and the uh, the website and stuff like that, we are continually updating um, uh, the uh, uh, the even the stuff that we are we are updating the stuff that we're even updating. Like, uh, for example, uh, if you guys looked at the uh, Ancram page or Ancram. You guys, you guys keep butchering the pronunciation of that so badly. I'm starting to say it. 
The on Karam. Oh, Black Betty and Karam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but if you go take a look back at the uh, uh, Ankrom, they uh, have uh, they have uh, uh, we've gone back over that and edited it and cleaned up the language a little bit and streamlined some of the things. But like, so right now, if you're seeing something and it looks a little rough and it looks a little off and like there's some typos or some weird uh, sentence construction, know that we're uh, going back through and editing it. But for right now, all the like raw information should be up on those different pages that we keep posting throughout the weeks. Um, but and that, be, hmm? yeah, and that being said, let us know, you know, if you notice a typo or have questions about something, you know, that you're reading, um, please hit us up and let us know so we can uh, clarify it or correct it, whatever we need to do to make that more understandable for you guys. Yeah, I know Caleb's already reached out once uh, about something and, and we were able to get that clarified. And um, any kind of feedback, guys, because we're building this for you guys, with you guys. So let us know what, what questions you have and we can always work on it. All right, well, unless there's anything else on the Beast Folk that anybody has. No? Um, seems like a good transition into um, our writing prompts that we've been doing. So let me bring one up here. And I'm going to share it with you guys. All right, so we have started a series called the Lore Dump Writing Prompts. Um, you guys have probably seen us post about these. Um, and essentially what's going on is as we're writing this new content and updating the cultures and all the things like that, once a week we've been posting, we've been featuring one of the different pages that we have been uh, writing. And while we've been doing this, um, we've been encouraging you guys, our players, to help us create more content. Help us fill in the gaps and, and create events and stories and things that's going to potentially be used in the game world lore and help us make it alive. So as we... As we post each one once a week, we have been submitting prompts for you guys. We've been submitting five prompts a week. Um, we're getting ready to uh, put up the next set of prompts. So we're on week four now. And um, the post that we're going to be making here in a little bit is going to be on the Beast Folk, since we've been talking about it today. Um, and we'll put up five new prompts for the Beast Folk. The idea around this, guys, is that you can write a story, you can write um, a history, a, an event that happened, something that helps us fill in different parts of our world. Now, you don't have to use the prompts themselves. They're there to help give you ideas and to stimulate your, your mind in thinking about it. Um, but you guys are able to submit one um, of these prompts a week and so we're on week four now so you could so you could have submitted up to four um, of these for this next week um, so I know we've gotten a couple from people uh, Ben has submitted one uh, Caleb has submitted one um, but don't hesitate to go back and say you know what I want to write one on uh, the Bahir, and uh, I'm going to use this prompt and go ahead and write it for week two. And for week three, oh, I really like this prompt about house chambers and how they're vampires, and I'm going to work with that. So 
you can submit one one for each week that we keep running with this series. Cool. Anybody have any questions about this? You actually just answered a question of mine, so. <laughs> So, so far we have launched um, on Chrome. We have launched the Bahir, Bahir Republic. Um, and we've also talked about uh, Duchy Jernigan. So those are the first three. And the next one is going to be about the race, the Beast Folk. This will be the first race that we, we post on. And it may be the only one because the Beast Folk are, are so specialized. Um, but uh, the Ankaram are, was founded by the Elves. The Bahir was founded by the Dwarves. Um, and then we're starting to move into some of the human um, founded duchies for the um, government known as the Halcyon Sovereignty, which by the way is the short name. The long name is kind of ridiculous, but I love it. Isn't all noble titles? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's really the big thing that the big things that we wanted to talk about, guys. Um, anybody have any questions over anything we've talked about so far today? Not at the moment. All right, anybody have any character questions? Matt, what kind of, uh, what kind of shenanigans is Tannis getting into? Oh yeah. Well, when I do find time to write about him, um, <laughs> he's uh, he's on another big hunt, and um, Ben and I need to finish our other story eventually. <laughs> yep. But um, well, thanks for helping, sweetie. Pretty much the same old stuff. Um, I'm trying to work in where I write in uh, how he got his new updated armor. But uh, it's still a process. Um, and, uh, oh, on another note, I got uh, another person interested in joining us once we start back up. And, um, awesome. Yeah, they'll be cool. Might be a gateway person, get her started. She'll bring other people in. We'll see. And they tell two friends, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends. <laughs> It's the oh, to be a dwarf. Scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I heard someone say they better be a dwarf. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, she's kind of built like a dwarf. She might be one. We'll see. <laughs> I, I'm sure Zaravica would love to uh, interact with more dwarves. <laughs> right? What the heck? <laughs> um, yeah. Caleb and I are working on um, more of some story interaction between uh, Rain and Hanu. Mm -hmm. We have the thing that was posted the other day, and then we're going to start another story block here, possibly this next week. Awesome. And I've been greatly enjoying everyone uh, working along with me to tell some Hanu interactions. Quite well, Everyone it'll be very great happy. because when you come in and actually get to play in a game, because you have yet to play in a game, um, I know. you're, you're <laughs> this already weird at this point. so much history. <laughs> like I said, which feels weird at this point. Uh, I especially love the idea of um, Hanu and I'm so bad with names. Uh, oh, shoot, Rick. Um, Amen or Simon? Amen. I especially love the idea of uh, Hanu and Amen being like um, Bill and Ted in, uh, 
in this great universe. <laughs> The scary, the scary part of that is it's that that's probably about what it would be like. <laughs> We're gonna just we'll we'll get into spirituality and you know all the philosophy and be half blasted at the same time. So, <laughs> what's not to love, dude? What's not to love? <laughs> Everyone's got their truth. <laughs> I'm finding mine at the end of this bottle, man. <laughs> well, anybody have... Um, is there any rules or anything that anybody this fuzzy on would love a, a touch up on or anything like that. Or do we have any input uh, from the, any of the, uh, the uh, cultures that we've posted about so far? Yeah. Um, this isn't so much an input. It's more just a, like a reaction, but, uh, uh, and you don't have to uh, say anything directly because I could still be writing on this, but Jeff, I, I, sent you an idea the other day for mm -hmm. I think House Jernigan, but it might be more properly for Desjardins and I get I get lost between which house is which. I'll be honest. Um did you send it an email or did you send it um through uh, Messenger? Uh through Messenger. It was just a it was just a concept. It was uh asking about possible revolutionaries within Right uh, one of the areas acting like part of the uh, Ankaram? Yeah, uh, that's something that uh, I, I read through it. That's something that the GMs will need to take a look at. Um, okay. The, the idea, I, I like where you're coming from with the idea. Um, mm -hmm. My only concern um, would be if they are mimicking or posing kind of as another um, culture, that could get, um, I don't know, that could st steer us in a direction um, with like cultural appropriation. And we want to make sure that we're navigating those waters well. I don't know. I if, I if it's for the purpose uh, of... Cool. I, I, I think I think the well, from my understanding, I, I don't see that particular problem. I, 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 it's interesting, like imposing as an you know, using posing as another nation to 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 uh, to get away with your insurrections. That's that's just that's just politics. Like, but we, we'll, yeah, we'll have to discuss that. It could be, uh, to give you an idea, and I, I assume this is Ryan speaking right now. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting to where I can understand your, your, your voice. Um, the thing that I was modeling something on is, uh, do you know of the Les Apaches in um, French culture? No. Uh, the Les Apaches, uh, Apaches are, I, they actually pronounced it differently were like uh, a criminal group within France that may have had some revolutionary uh, tendencies as well. Um, what I read says that uh, they were called Les Apaches partially because of their savagery, but also par possibly because of some of their styles of dress. So it was an, an unfortunate comparison. Yeah, but I do think that some cultures make unfortunate comparisons anyway. Um, yeah. And it was just, it was like a seed of an idea, honestly, because I was, uh, I've been looking at Victorian culture and other aspects of Victorian culture for other characters. Mm -hmm. I came across that and was like, oh, that's interesting. What if I tried to weave that into something somewhere? Well, 
why don't you, because it, it is something that um, we have a GM meeting tomorrow and it's something that, that we'll bring up and we'll kind of talk about then. Um, why don't you work on a story submission for the writing okay. prompt um, that could kind of give us more of what you're seeing? And it may be something where just a small tweak of it could could fit or it might be right on and, and we love it and run with it. Okay. Real quick to, I, to bounce back to a, a thing that you mentioned earlier, um, uh, getting confused between the, the local noble houses uh, and like exactly who they are and stuff like that. So um, uh -huh. uh, it, the, the easy rule of thumb is the Deschardins and anybody who is more Franco uh, or French in their uh, in their like in their house name is all in one basically alliance block, and everybody who's more Norman Saxon in their uh, in their in their uh, in their name. So uh, the uh, the Jernigans, the the uh, the Chambers, the uh, uh, the, the voices. Sten uh, no, well, Stenstrom's not uh, Stenstrom's from, uh, is from another place completely. Yeah. Um, but those are all uh, those are all in a different alliance block. So Jernigans are on the same side as the Royces, but they're the bigger house. They're the, they're the people who are actually holding the duchy at the moment. But gotcha. they're also the allies of the Royces. Whereas your which so your Rousseaus, your Renaults, your Desjardins, uh, all those guys are all in uh, their own separate alliance block. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and I, I would want to set... Go ahead. I shared a link here um, for Duchy Jernigan has all of the, the major houses listed. Um, so there, there may be some uh, tweaks that still happen with it, but um, you should be able to see all the house names to be able to kind of see what... Ryan is talking about. Okay. Uh, but I, I hope uh, I clarify uh, something because I can, I, I can understand though with the amount of different noble house names and where they're all coming from, especially if there's no uh, game to play around it right now, it's, it could be difficult to track. Oh, and dude, I, I am terrible with names anyway. I mean, yeah. like half the time at work, I feel like I've got to refer to my own name tag to be sure what I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do uh, when I'm thinking of this I do want to set it within the more Frankish um, area just because yep. Les Apaches uh, uh, were in France uh, I might try to throw a Wikipedia link to a group of you just to give you more of an idea of what I'm working with and how I'm working with it, with it. I'm also throwing in there the whole idea of um, the tea party being done with uh, members of dressing up like natives. Yes. Uh, so some of this is the idea that there's this group that's trying to throw off their actions by making it seem like uh, part of the Empire, and also just attaching to that. I would like it to be within the same culture that. Um, that has some active slavery, but I forget which house or which group that is that most often does. I thought it was Desjardins, but I'm not sure. Desjardins are the easy villains of the current like setting. Yeah. <laughs> well, because that, that they... makes this easier because I don't want to portray this as a, uh, and again, sorry for speaking over you. I don't want to portray this as necessarily a good group of people or necessarily a bad. They, they're kind of both. Mm -hmm. uh, what, at least that's the that, seed, that, the idea that I've got. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to, to, to shoot for with a lot more of that, what we're revising with stuff. But uh, Desjardins have been a common uh, 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 enemy in the narrative. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, there was even a, a plot um, that had a Desjardins assassinated um, that we worked with. And uh, just to give you an idea, the, the Desjardins family tends to be opportunistic, ambitious, and cunning. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the mentality of the, the house. 
Well, the idea yeah. then of these uh, ankura, as I'm calling them tentatively, is that they're typically lower class citizens and probably tied to some criminal activity. Some of what they do is good, some of what, uh, some of what they do is bad. Uh, they do play some of it off on mimicking um, elven or ankura customs and dress and so on within the lower class within the greater society. Sure. Um, we had we had a player who was interested in trying to um, do some uh, mob style um, storylines uh, before, um, and that was Seth. And they had they they had a character that they were playing around with a, a possible group starting a group that was more um, nefarious in their kind of uh, actions. Um, so there's been some kind of hints at that in game before. Not a whole lot has been done with it. Um, mm -hmm. but um, there's certainly potential for it. Um, One of the I'll ways that uh, Les Apaches are... Uh, sorry, I, I do this again. Uh, one of the ways that Les Apaches are kind of known is there's a dance that's associated with that part of culture. Uh, if you've ever seen um, uh, persons in like vaguely French dress doing a dance that almost looks like the male dancer is abusing the female dancer. Where he's like, say, slapping his partner or throwing her down and then picking her back up. It's an older dance, like I want to say like early 1900s. Uh, hmm. But what it is enacting is basically, um, sorry for the terms, but a, um, a, a, uh, Streetwalker and her, I'm going to use the term manager. Yes. Um, and that is associated somewhat with uh, Les Apache. In fact, it might be called the Apache dance. The, so um, related back to uh, if you're wanting to uh, have a, 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 a subculture aping the larger uh, overculture of, of, of Ankram style or Ankram style. The, the, if you're wanting to uh, potentially play with an insurrection narrative, one of the big things about the Ankram is they don't have uh, a social hierarchy and mm -hmm. they like the, the, the lack of social hierarchy is integral to, uh, to their culture. Um, so uh, and, and uh, anything that'd be a normal, normally a social order. So if you're having a people fight the social order using the Ankram as a as a template to kind of base their uh, their uh, identity off of, would make a lot of sense. Yeah, almost like anarchists by nature because they're make, mimicking a system that doesn't really have a. Uh, an order to it. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 from 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 the human perspective, it doesn't have an order to it. From from the Ankarom's perspective, it's uh, if you've read the, the that entire thing, it is the uh, idea that like everybody kind of knows what they should be doing almost innately, so they just kind of pick up and do what they need to do without without need for instruction or management, which is a very much an would be an alien type of. Uh, uh, thing in in a human culture, or a, or in in uh, from a, from a more you know uh, halcyon pr perspective, or any actually any other culture that def def defines himself on on order. But yeah, so the more I think about it, the more I like the idea of it because well, I haven't read a lot on um, like the mafia or things like that, but I have read rather a bit on um, tongs and things like that. And many tongs began as uh, benevolent societies. 
uh, and then sort of transform from there. So I, I don't know. I like I like the ideas that this is going with. It's going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of research. I think <laughs> I'm willing. <though. laughs> anyway, yeah. Thanks for talking it out with. Me. Of course. Well, and um, you never know. You might uh, you might find other players who are interested in potentially um, this kind of story and working with this kind of group, um, like the the one that I mentioned, Seth, um, may find that interesting. For example, so cool. Awesome. Uh, what uh, what else, guys? What uh, anything that you guys read over the Bahir Republic that you found interesting or um, wanted to ask about? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be honest and say I haven't had the time to read. <laughs> Has there been much nailed down more about um, That's fair. Um, the kind of holidays that they celebrate? Um, we haven't had a lot of questions or anything on them. Uh, we can kind of talk about them here if you want to. I will question your ear off if you let me. So, like... Hey, that's what the socials are for. <laughs> you don't understand. The so. dwarf wants to know about the dwarves. <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with that. So let, let's talk holidays for the dwarves. Um, do you want me to give a, a bit of an intro or do you have a specific question in mind? Um... Do they have any sort of like uh, grand feasts? Food central? Um, yeah. So the Bahir culture has a little bit different structure um, to it than what all the other cultures have in that they have three major um, phases of their year. And each phase ends with a week-long celebration. And so these three celebrations are going to be full of people indulging themselves, um, having a great time, um, having competitions with one another. Um, we have a, a, a Coliseum-style a uh, celebration that happens where all of the different uh, obligations will challenge each other to different types of events. And there's people that are awarded the top of their obligation and like um, Is that what we're different calling obligations, them? obligations? Hold the trophies. Yes. Right? Am I saying that right, guys? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask if Zoravica will be partaking in the dwarf wrestling. <laughs> uh, dwarf wrestling is, well, I don't know. I hope dwarf wrestling is different than uh, elven wrestling. So, <laughs> <laughs> elven wrestling didn't go so good last time. Dwarf it's wrestling a, is getting tired of together. <laughs> It's, 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 it's a shoulder beard wrestling. You know, you grab by the beard and then under the shoulder and then you go for your throws. <laughs> See, Ryan said uh, dwarven wrestling is you tie the beards together. <laughs> oh, yes! No, I like that better. I like that better. 
It's never any further than the distance of your two beards. <laughs> um, so uh, let me take one step back here and kind of emphasize something about the Bahir um, culture in that they are they are very every there's a whole bunch of different obligations that exist inside the culture and each of these obligations is kind of like a job role um but even though there's so much division within the culture the entirety of the culture follows by an aspect of host and guest mentality so if you are a guest in somebody's home or in somebody's um place of business or something like that you have certain things that you uh certain cultural standards that you need up to and as a host you also have those cultural standards so um a host takes care of their guest and prepares meals and and makes sure they're comfortable and things like that um so that is always part of the bahir uh culture um but this these three week-long celebrations that happen are um, a, a time where all of the rules of your obligation and, and work um, are relaxed for a period of time. And you uh, um, will normally you only hang out with people within your work, your obligation, but during these three um, holiday breaks, if you will, um, you're going to be experiencing all the other obligations, working with people from all over, celebrating, drinking, having extensive meals. Um, it, it's kind of like a work hard, play hard type of uh, separation. Sounds like more than rum spring up. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> let, do all the races on Astral do they follow the same kind of calendar, or is it different per say culture? Like I know that dwarves will have different holidays than the humans, and the same goes for the elves, uh, or even the beast folk. But do they follow the same calendar? Like let's say, like we have the Julian cal calendar, and then we have the Gregorian calendar, like but not most people follow the same, even though they're somewhat. Yeah. That, that's I a really good say, question. I would say for so just simplicity's sake, yes, let's have them all follow the same calendar. But I think we do have them actually following all the same calendar because yeah. there, are, there are holidays that overlap with each other. Like uh, there is a, a holiday that the Ankaram and the Bahir share with each other. Also, and that is Armistice Day. Also, um, a dwarf doesn't have to be Bahir. They're prominently Bahir, but a dwarf can be uh, uh, Ankaram, a dwarf can be um, Bahir, a dwarf can be um, what's the what's the other one that we haven't brought up yet? Halcyon. Or are you talking about the um, Vertigon? Yeah, or a, a, a dwarf could be Vertigron. Yeah, and that's a really good point, April, and I'm glad you, you made it. Um, uh, even though Bahir, a, a lot of people will associate dwarves with the Bahir, um, there's other races there as well. There are humans there, there are elves there, um, but Mostly the majority of them... <laughs> yeah. Mostly goat people are the other people that live in the mountains. <laughs> Mostly goat people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's a really good point. And and although there are a majority of dwarves will probably be in the Bahir, you can find them anywhere. Same with elves in the Ankram. They, you're going to find a lot of them there, but you're also going to find them other places as well. It sounds like Dwarven society is very structured and regimented. Very much so. It is the, it is like the pinnacle of organization. Bureaucracy, you know, the bureaucrats watching the bureaucrats watching the bureaucrats. Is there an element of their society that is contrary to this? 
for the no. Bahir? Yeah. Not um, particularly. Why not? Uh, the in the same sense that the Ankaram have these uh, a an almost innate sense of of uh, you know do what you need to do when you need to do it. The uh, the uh, the Bahir society has an almost innate sense of social structure of like down to like in in Bahir society you adopt either your uh, either one of your parents uh, 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 trades and then you take on their name and then like their last name and then that's you define yourself as being of that trade whereas like you have a rigid sense of identity through throughout and everybody has a rigid sense of identity including uh like i don't know yeah it, what one of the examples that we used for previously for the Bahir, um, if you imagine, you know, we're in real in real life, you know, government's planning. So, you know, we're going to repair this bridge. We got we know we've got this kind of, you know, they're doing repairs, road work, all of that. The Bahir is working on an organizational level of generations, so they know they're they actually are planning manpower and hours for projects that they know they're going to need, housing, um, furnishings, food, support, decades in advance. That's how that's how structured they are. Yep. The re part of the reason that I ask that is Taoism was born out of a strict, strict rigid society and was a reaction to um, similar structures within China. Um, I could easily see somebody within that social structure being like, yeah, but I'm going to go different. Uh, typically, yeah. then uh, they would uh, potentially try to move out of the Bahiri Republic. Yeah. that That's where you would get people who would like uh, your uh, displaced, like people who don't fit in with the culture that they belong, that they were born to, would potentially travel abroad. Um, and that, that's not un unheard of for, and that's why we say, you know, you can find a dwarf in other lands is because not necessarily they're going to feel attached to the culture that they're born to. But yeah. um, mm -hmm. um, on the whole, the Bahiri Republic is going to be a... Uh, 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 this uh, the, it, it is uh, you you regiment all aspects of your life and uh, and organize all aspects of your life in this sort of hyper communal like it, 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 they're they're the uh, the elves and the dwarves sorry the Ankaram and and in the and the Bahir uh, are kind of uh, inverses of each other, where the Ankaram have a a uh, a hyper communal society that's based off of no social structure. The the Bahir are a hyper communal society that is based off of only social structure. Yeah, with with all three of the um, other uh, governing bodies that exist, other than the Halcyon sovereignty, which is the the governing body we live in. Um, all three of the other ones, the Ankram, the Bahir Republic, and the Vertigran, we wanted them to feel alien in some aspects, but also familiar in others. Um, so we, we took certain cultural um, significant markers and we enhanced them and we took them to an extreme. Um, so for some players, they, they may not feel comfortable having that be their source, or maybe that is their source, and that's why they left. And so it, it really gives a diversity to the cultures to have that those extremes as part of them. I get that. Um, I think it might be interesting to, uh, let's say, play a dwarf from that culture 
who's like, yeah, but I practice this other thing. Yeah. That used to be common. I, uh, the whole conversation has me thinking back to an episode of, uh, did anybody else ever watch uh, Babylon 5? Yeah. A little bit. Do you remember yeah. the episode where uh, all the different religions were on Babylon 5? Like they had a rep re representation of um, uh, each of the different races and their religions. Mm -hmm. And okay. then they asked Earth, uh, would you like one of your representatives to come here? And um, like the ambassador was like, no. <laughs> and they had like 16 for Earth. And my friend, uh, Rob, who writes science fiction and has been published a few times, he was like, well, that's that's like a subtle dig at science fiction in general. That we will tend to uh, represent alien cultures by being like, yeah, and then alien culture is like this. And we're like all these other things. Um, so to me, uh, and this isn't just for Dwarven, it's also for An Ankurama, and uh, whatever, um, it would be interesting to see, like, what about the outliers? Well, and I, and I think that's where I think that's where it gives the player you you as a player when you're developing your character that gives you some back some instant background of okay, my family did not agree with this this way of life. We decide that we decide to travel, and I was born in a different different area or i chose to leave because you know i got sick of the rat race of the bahiri and wanted to move wanted to explore i mean there's it lends itself to some more inventive st storytelling i think yeah, yeah. but and this is, again that, that entire criticism is i feel like why we tried to move away from the identity of this is the elven land of no this is a nation that has a certain cultural identity that has like, you know, that, you know, that there are, there is more of a, like, yeah, it, it is not integral to the, the race of the elves that they all believe like this and think like this. It is this specific country that was founded by elves that uh, have this particular tie to, well, it, where, where all these actually come from, specifically the Ankram and the, the, the Bahir, are from uh, 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 from the planes that they were derived from, i.e., Fey and Imperium. Uh, that uh, mm. dwarves are effectively uh, more imperial in nature, and uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the elves are more Fey in nature. And, and it's, the 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 idea of of natural order versus societal order. Another thing that plays into that as well is um, elves can live, what did we say, up to 300 years? Um, yes. And dwarves can live up to 200. So with longer lasting individuals in influence of cultures like that, um, I think you'll find, or I think the kind of theory that we're going with is that there's less cultural change and shift than there would be with races that don't tend to live as long. Yeah. Sorry to be, um, sorry to like throw a monkey in the, oh gosh. <laughs> throw a monkey uh -huh. in the <laughs> I love it. Continue. Not very appropriate. No, Not very and, and appropriate. These are, these are good questions though. Um, and these are things that we love to talk about heck some of us gms just get together and sometimes we just talk about larp stuff and be like what if guys what if we did this <laughs> and um just kind of really talk would like to hear somebody's ideas of like well i want to make a i want to make a dwarf i want to make an elf or whatever uh and mine is mine is an outlier yeah uh yeah. mine is for like a culture that's that's since been lost or abandoned or went in a different direction because uh, I don't know that that's an interesting story. Sure. Yeah. And it you could easily you could easily have that you could have a um, dwarf that was born into um, 
say a small group of uh, Bahir that um, were kind of leaning against the culture that they were a part of. And how did that go? How did that interaction happen? Um, did they decide to stay? Did they decide to leave? Like, there's all kinds of ways you can go about that. And we fully support you players in exploring those concepts. I like that. I like that. I like um, even to think that maybe some of the players that would do such, their their families might be tied to the uh, the peace between um, dwarven and elven races. Very much so. The yeah. uh, the uh, and then once uh, once we get around to it, though, uh, we'll have another. Uh, so we have these Bahir, we have the Ankaran that are uh, kind of like inversions of each other. Uh, and then we will transfer a uh, few weeks uh, to focus on uh, the, the Vertigrant, who are actual opposites of those, uh, of those uh, two groups of a hyper-individualistic uh, society. One that is so, so individualistic that like, uh, as opposed to like a human, like, you know, modern human society, your family and your heritage and your bloodline genuinely don't matter. It is all in like, like a personal accomplishment and uh, focusing on that. Yeah. But also weirdly building a community and a society around hyper-individualism. Hmm. Cool. Something that I, I, I think, and I'll throw it out here as an idea, um, something that we might do at future socials might be if people are considering um, making a, a a new character, um, maybe we can talk through a few people um, that have an interest in making a new character and kind of help them uh, consider cultural aspects and, and talk through some of those things. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't end up, if those cr characters don't end up being created, we could talk through the idea um, and kind of give some examples of how people would consider these things. Mm. Be a fun little workshop, I think. Yeah. And, and something like, and I mean, the whole premise of this again is um, freeing up you freeing up the players uh, you the players to allow you guys to really write your characters um, again taking those constraints off of oh I play an elf so I have to do elf things no not necessarily you can be an elf that grew up with a Verderon and at that point you are you can ident best identify what your character and what you want to do with that character with anywhere at this point yep Fun, fun, fun. April, did you have any other questions about my here? I know we went on a really weird tangent. Oh no, I'm <laughs> I'm all here for tangents because that's where the interesting questions come from. <laughs> um, but was there anything else about the Bahir that you were curious about? In Bahiri culture, do feminine dwarves have beards? They can. And uh, it is not uncommon for uh, feminine dwarves to be, uh, to have uh, beards. The, the, um, the thought of, of, of uh, Bahiri, uh, uh, beauty standards is androgynous with a focus like so there's there's the Ankram are feminine androgynous so the the uh idea uh, the ideal uh Ankram person would be very feminine in profile uh but like regardless of whether or not of what sex they are what they gender what they identify as their gender they would be they would almost ideally everyone would strike a more feminine profile, whereas the uh, Bahir would all strike a more masculine profile. So the 
your your ur dwarf would be short stout ma- built like a like a uh like a brick shit house uh with a with a massive beard and just like you know and th- but that's that's the idea, that's the beauty standard that uh that is held uh, regardless of 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 uh, uh of sex or gender identity is this more yeah less no, dimorphic no, no. than no, than no, no. Mm-hmm. Sorry, so Ankrom is like uh, Tilda Swinton, and uh, uh, Bahir is more. Oh, Brian Robin Blessed. Williams. Say again. <laughs> Brian Blessed. If if anybody's familiar with that, with who he is. I have a hard time placing him. I'll be honest. Um, oh, I love him. Jeff pulled up some pictures. He's just Say that a again? big. He's just a big mass of beard and teeth, and and uh, uh, just this, like, almost the the stereotypical um, British explorer. That's just the just the oh, manly okay. man with the biggest beard and the the heartiest <laughs> laugh and the most booming. Yeah, him. <laughs> okay. Good. So, I climbed to the top of Everest, and I did it all by myself, type of, uh, <laughs> just to prove that I could, and it's at the age of 65, ta- that type of person. Hmm. Yeah. Another kind of difference, um, but similarity between the Ankaram and the Bahir is that the art styles um, for the Ankaram is more um, Art Nouveau style, long, elongated, um, curving figures, whereas the art style of the, the Bahir is more Art Deco. Which is more angular, more um, uh, bulky. Um, both of them are very similar, but different. And so that that I think epitomes a lot of their culture as well. Didn't in a brainstorming session at one point. You tell me if I'm remembering this completely wrong because it's totally okay. Um, uh, a Bahiri culture, one of their big like symbolic shapes is um, uh, hexagon. Yes. Uh, yeah. Kind of a symbol for the, the Bahir is um, it, it's, it's a hexagon but with six pieces. The triangles. Uh, yeah, basically. Um, so, like, it's it's one unified hexagon, which is supposed to represent the different um, the different aspects um, of their culture. the The aspects being the um, the artisan, the farseer, the food bearer, lawkeeper, peacemaker, laborer, um, which is where we get the obligations is from those six. Good questions, guys. Yeah. World building is pretty cool. <laughs> pretty <Yeah. fun. laughs> I love doing it. Because this is something that I'm interested in doing for you guys, what maps do you want to see? Well, first, let me say, are you the one that did the map that we're currently? I did not. I did not make the maps. <laughs> um, I color them in and I draw lines and I make uh, 
the, the different things. Um, it was originally uh, Jeff and Kay who did a lot of the map work. Yeah, the, the GMs kind of collaborated to create the world, and then Kay, Kay did the original designs, and I helped with them, and, and April has now been wanting to keep going with that momentum. Jeff has let me play around with the, the map program in some separate files. Um, the, the, the recent maps that have come out with the, the plain white with the different colored sections highlighting where things are, um, I colored those. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Those are the geopolitical maps, right? Yes. Yeah. I figured that oh. like a uh, kind of salmon color wouldn't be too harsh because I know yellow is really harsh on the eyes sometimes and I didn't want red. But the more I look at it, the more it looks pink instead of salmon. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do want to thank you for these maps because it definitely does help kind of emphasize like this article right here I'm looking at is the Bahia Republic and um, so the, the map that's listed here shows you what region the, the Bahia Republic actually is. I was super happy for these maps too because I always thought the Bahir and the Anchoram were the other way around. Well, I've got to say with the maps and with the other work that's been being done here recently, uh, the whole site has sure. gone from it looks like something simple to really looking like a very professional, almost like a, a role playing game that I might pick up at a store. Aww. Right. Thank you. That's that's <laughs> mightily impressive. That's mightily impressive. It's, it's been a huge transformation. I and don't one, I don't know how many hours have gone into it at this point. <laughs> I can understand that. Yeah. It's incredibly cool. Well, and Jeff, Jeff, you've done a great job of just kind of keeping that updated, and also. Um, you know, realistically, that's that's how we want that site to look like. We want it to be a, oh, it's just a, oh, it's an RPG. I'm just going to jump in the story and go for it. It's pretty badass. <laughs> we, we want there to be enough information that you can jump in at any time and just be like, oh, man, I really, I need to know um, armor. What's, what's required by armor? Well, let me go here to the game rules and armor is going to, be a combat thing. So if I click on combat, you can come here and you can see the details on um, what what is needed for that armor. So, like, and then, an and yeah, and then the other benefit, especially with the cultures, um, for you as players, as as players get dive into this these cultures, is especially going to be useful when you're NPCing. If you're NPC NPCing a specific type of character from a specific type of background, you'll kind of already have that headspace of this is how that person should be thinking. This is kind of how they, sh you know, kind of what their their belief system is. So it really helps you get helps you guys as players and us as GMs really to kind of make those NPCs that much more realistic and more part of this world. Cool. All right. Um, Kanan, you just joined us. Um, did you have any questions or anything that you wanted to uh, throw out to us while we were here? Oh, no. Kanan, I can't hear you. There we go. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, I didn't really have any questions this time around. I wanted to jump in, but one of the things I did want to say was that the the lore dumps have been aiding with that a lot. There hasn't been a whole lot of questions that I've had that have been unanswered due to just all these lore dumps and everyone's written. I feel like the the Facebook page has been more active now than I've seen it before. Um, so 
a lot of the questions I've had, I've even just been able to like throw out there, and they've been they've been asked. So, cool. I just attended because I wanted to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 hi. We miss you. <laughs> hi, I miss you guys too. Hi. Glad you joined us. Oh, I did think of something um, to mention to everybody. Uh, you guys probably saw a post uh, a couple weeks back or last week or so. I already started to. Okay. Um, there uh, was an individual who was wanting to do um, some photos to build their uh, build portfolio. their uh, portfolio. Um, some of us have been reaching out and seeing who's interested in it. Um, if anybody watching this um, is interested, um, go back, find that post. It was a couple weeks ago, or last week, I think. Um, uh, message on it. Um, Angela posted it. Um, reach out. I know several of us in this meeting are all interested, and I, I think there's plenty of others as well that are interested. Uh, new photos is great. Um, and uh, we always love them. It's great advertising for us overall and for us individually. So um, take those opportunities if you can. And it's uh, also a cool way to kind of get some new photos of what you guys have been working on. Matt and your armor and, and Ben and your armor that you're working on. And um, yeah. So. Uh, Matt, you better be there. <laughs> Speaking of the photos and everything, I was kind of curious as to what was going on with that. I had emailed the the person taking the photos, and I, it was kind of an open-ended email that I got as a reply. It was just kind of like, whatever you want to do photos, let me know. And so, was, you know, I don't know a whole lot of context with it as to what the plan is. Is it the same photographer that's showing up on the 7th as, as it was involved with that post? Yeah, um, April was reaching out to to many of you guys about it. Um, we'll we'll chat more about it online or offline. But yeah, it, it's the same individual that okay. um, that we were looking at. Cool, that helps me a lot. Perfect. Um, awesome. Well, does anybody have any other questions or topics um, that we can bring up while we're recording this meeting? Um, don't forget, play, um, those of you that do have civil service points, um, the GMs right now, since uh, we aren't, since we're just doing remote stuff and uh, not doing events, please submit your upgrade, your ability upgrades. We want to, we want to take a look at those and just be able to, again, another way you can further individualize your character and personalize that. So use the, use that, submit that over. I, I'm going to, uh, to brag on April here for a moment. Uh, April, <laughs> she chose some, some very interesting abilities to upgrade. Um, so hope you guys don't want to do any PVP against her in the near future because uh, it, you're going to get some surprises. <laughs> Stuff's just straight up busted at this. Not, not busted, but like just dirty. I'm going to say dirty. Dirty is the, the, the word to use. It was very inventive. I still, I still want a duration on Dodge. Dang it. <laughs> I had a lot of points because I went to almost every event last year and I spent them wisely. <laughs> um. Ooh, I do know one thing that I'm just going to tease. Uh, hopefully we'll get this resolved, uh, this this GM meeting. But we have one more thing aside from the like the writing prompts and lore dumps that we're going to release to you guys that is a long time coming and hopefully will allow us you guys to support us uh, through this uh, interesting time if you guys can. But we've got one last uh, uh, fun little thing that we're going to be doing that will... Uh, Again, hopefully, be going live this next week. So keep keep your eyes peeled on the page, so that yeah, for when that comes out. Cryptic self promotion. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so awesome. 
All right. Well, uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff. Um, we can still continue to hang out here, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and cap off the recording. So um, I do want to thank everybody who um, was able to show up today, and I want to thank everybody who's watching this. Thank you so much for being a part of Metal Mirror. We really appreciate it. Um, we hope that uh, you are staying safe and um, taking care of yourself and your loved ones. And um, we hope to be seeing you as soon as possible. <laughs> we will definitely yeah. see you at the next social. Yeah. See you then. <laughs> Bye.